Hi everyone, it's uh, the 30th of January and uh, pike fishing today on the Bristol Avon. Must be about three or four years since I last did it. But uh, yeah, I'm knackered and there's a time and place for everything. I should be doing my tax, end of year tax return. So I'm going to get set up as quickly as I can, starting off with my chair. It's slowed down nicely, it's still a reasonable pace and a little bit colour, not much. But the weather is absolutely spot on, it's about 14 degrees. I've chosen a spot where I've got a nice dog leg in the river. So I've got a slack um, on my inside line where I'm going to put a float out. But to plumb the depth, I'm not using a plummet, I'm using a two ounce lead. That's actually plumb depth. I've got a three pound test curve carp rod. I won't use the bait runner function on it because it's going to be my float rod. But yeah, so 18 pound line is a minimum. A large um, specimen net and it's nice and cheap. If I have to cut holes in it, I will, and to get troubles back. So at the um, terminal end, I'm fishing half a mackerel, single hook at the top, that is barbed, and treble into the dorsal fin at the top, where there's a little bit more bristle for the hook to stay in. Other two points are barbless. I think that's a size, um, a size eight or a size six. SSGs and a good lead on a separate piece of amnesia line. Uh, that's to stop the abrasion of the, the lead. And then I've got a sliding pike bung on. I'm using a 35 gram uh, sliding float with a bead above it. And then I've got a stop knot and that's tied with power gum. I've already plumbed the depth. It is important to plumb the depth to avoid deep hooking. Laid out there, I've got my unhooking mat. I've also got a waist sling, some snips, long nose forceps and some standard forceps. There's no point using long nose forceps if I can see the hooks nice and close to the front of the mouth because they're less effective. My plan is to fish with the bait just suspended off the bottom. It's very snaggy down there. And so I'm gonna move my stop knot down by the length, same length of the trace, so it's just off the bottom. So that's drifting around in the, in the eddy, in circles basically. Any food coming down the river, any dead fish that have been killed by the frosts, recent frosts or floods, will hopefully be pulled up um, in this area. The baits I'm using today are mackerel. Uh, they're still a bit frozen, but I'd much rather them be frozen than defrosted, if I'm honest. I want them to be as fresh as possible. Pike don't like resistance. That's why you'll see a lot of pike anglers fishing with their pike bung flat on the surface, slightly over depth. And in the depths of winter, I've found that pike can sit there, eat the bait, and the float not move. So that's why I'm not doing that today. Uh, ledger bait set up. It's on an 18 inch long running trace. And I've elasticated the, um, the hooks down onto the mackerel. And I'm going to flatten these barbs down. You've got to be really careful when you cast out to make sure that um, the bait lands away from the main line. Otherwise you could end up really damaging the pike. I've got it set up high as possible to get the line out the main flow. Right, an hour's passed, nothing's going on, so I'm just going to move down to the next corner where it's a little bit slacker, a little bit shallower. You can see it slows down a little bit more. I've got much more of a slack. I'm obviously not the only one that fishes here because uh, shells on the bank. Otter? As I say, I've only got an hour left. I'll have to go and pick up my son. In the winter, these fish can sit there dormant, doing nothing for weeks on end. So you do sometimes just have to get mobile and find them. But there's a definite bit of pike movement up from the surface. Just another 20-30 yards down where it really slows down the flow. You now you get that niggling feeling and the more you think about it, the more it won't go away. I need to move, even though I've only been here for about 10 minutes, I need to move. You can see from the huge amount of silt that's deposited down here, that when this river is really chugging through, it's all being dumped. On this bend, it settles up nicely on that silt bank. So if I was to put money on which bait were to get hit first, not that either necessarily will be hit, it would be the float just because it's moving around a little bit more naturally in this current. If I was to put money on which line's most likely to get snagged, it'd be the float. It's moving around and it's going to find a snag and I won't know about it until I try and wind it in. So I don't leave it out for more than about 15 minutes. I really don't see any point in fishing further away than what's necessary. 
I'd like to be able to have a good vision on uh, on the float and also on where the line enters the water when I'm uh, using the lead. Just looking at my pike bung. And I'm wondering whether maybe something's picked that up. If I am going to strike, I'm going to strike really hard. Yeah, that was a definite bob. Right, let's get this going. Play an arm open. Right, that's going. <laughs> it's a jack. Now, bold accounts, there should be loads of huge fish in this stretch. Because there's shoals of bream here between four and seven pounds. So somewhere out there you'd think there's a huge 20, 30 pound fish. So I'm just checking his mouth for any hooks and there's none. But they are. It's a pike. That's great. Let's get it back. Actually, I'm not going to use the net. I'm going to put this one back in my hand. But I'm not going to be treading on that silt because it looks lethal. Is there some damage to the binder's gill on the other side? I think there might be, you know. Maybe a heron or a cormorant has tried to get it, get hold of this fish. Otherwise, it looks like a very healthy fish, but yeah, just behind his gill plate on the right hand side. We better. Oh, there we go. <laughs> he is gone. Good stuff. Well, I was right about the float going first, wasn't I? Must be right about something for once. I wonder how Jesse's getting on. He had a fantastic fish when I fished with him last time. That's what inspired me to come out and give it a go myself. Do you know what? I think I've got another bite. That float's travelling upstream. That's a run. That's a better fish, isn't it? Yeah, that's a better fish that's staying deep. God, blimey, he's woken up. Oh, you missed all that. <laughs> the camera's facing the wrong way. I mean, that was out for about five minutes after that little one. To get the bear lamb undone. Well, it's bigger than I thought, actually. <laughs> yeah, nice fish. Possibly pushing on double. Gosh, lively. What I'm trying to do is turn him upside down. There we go. Lift the gill plate. Yeah, I can see the hook is actually in the gill. So I'm be quite careful here. Right, that's out the gill. Right, take the treble out, get some forceps on the treble, just so that if he flashes around, it's in the forceps, not me. And what I might have to do with this single is uh, flatten the barb to get that out. There we are, that's out. So, we'll see, he's easily uh, pushing on double figures. Cracking fish. That's worth coming out for, isn't it? It's worth changing spots until you find the fish. And I will use the net to put this one back. I won't weigh him. And away it goes. Great. I better go home and pick up my son from school and then do my tax return. <laughs> Cheers for watching.